So, I need to tell you a little bit about William Rufus, or William II. And um, the information I'm going to give you here is pretty much just stuff from the top of my head. So, it's not going to be things uh, like the impressive bits of knowledge that will give you the A star chance. You're going to have to use the timeline and other bits of information, things that you take in class, to learn the nitty gritty and the bits and pieces. So, perhaps the first most important thing to know about William Rufus is he's got a really bad reputation. And this is largely because the people writing at the time, the contemporary historians, you would say, um, were almost all ecclesiastical. They are all members of the church. And William Rufus did not have a particularly good relationship with the church. And this is largely because of his money grabbing. You might remember Lanfranc, the Archbishop of Canterbury under William the Conqueror, which is William II or William Rufus's dad. Well, Lanfranc died a couple of years into William Rufus's reign and... Um, William II, William Rufus, what he wanted was money, a bit like his dad actually. Um, and one way he realised he could get this was by not replacing the Archbishop of Canterbury right away. Um, and so for a few years, I believe from 1089 to 1093, he didn't have an Archbishop of Canterbury and he collected the rents on the lands owned by uh, the Archbishop Frick of Canterbury. Um, so that gave him a lot more money, but also a fair amount of unpopularity from the church, because he was basically taking money that otherwise would go towards the church. In 1093, William got ill, seriously ill. He thought he was dying, he thought he was on his deathbed, and it seems at that point he thought, oh no, I might end up going to hell because of what I've done with the church. and maybe the Arch It wasn't just the Archbishop of Canterbury, he did it with other church positions as well. Somebody died... He didn't replace them so that he could collect the cash that otherwise the church would collect. So he probably thought, oh no, he's had a bit of a pang of conscience and a, a fear that he's going to hell. So he decides they need an Archbishop of Canterbury. Who shall I have? Now it just so happens that in England at the time was a man called Anselm. He was very well known, even still now people debate his ideas about the existence of God. Um and he was in England for a different reason, but he was in England, and he was a prime candidate. Very intelligent man, but um, very much an academic. He did a lot of writing. He didn't want to be Archbishop of Canterbury. It was forced upon him. And William said, oh, look, come on, be my Archbishop of Canterbury. I'll change my ways. You can have total control over the monies of the church, and we'll do what you say, and you can be my spiritual guide. Um, answer them. Well, didn't get left with too much choice, had to take the job, never really wanted it. So from 1093 until his death in 1100, uh, William Rufus and Anselm fell out continuously. One, and this, again, is one of the reasons why he has such a bad reputation. Um, because the people writing the histories were churchmen, and William had a huge falling out with Anselm. Anselm was upset about the dealings and the goings-on at court, at William's court. And one of the words that's really... Um, tarnished William's reputation a little bit is the word sodomy. Now it's an interesting word for me to explain to you on a podcast if you don't know what it means. In today's money it means, um, how do I put this, not having sexual intercourse up the right hole. That's right. Um, but then it didn't mean that. Then it just meant having any kind of sexual intercourse without it creating a baby, which is a little bit different, as you can see. But the, the outcome of the ecclesiastical contemporary historians writing about this word sodomy as a criticism of William Rufus is that people have, uh, down the ages, historians down the ages, have thought, well, William Rufus was homosexual then. There is actually no real proof that he was homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual, or whatever. Um, he probably had sex without it creating children, which wasn't probably unusual for, for kings at the time. But this, this has come to haunt him, you see, and this is one of the things that Anselm was upset about. Anselm was saying, you must cut out the sodomy. And he was upset about other things as well, like just general actions, the party animal style of court. Men wearing long hair was another thing that he was upset about, which has also um, helped those rumours about William Rufus. And William Rufus basically said something along the lines of, it's my court, I can do what I want with it, you do what you want with your churches. Um, so he wouldn't change his ways. So Anselm had kept a peace, he said, can I go abroad please, can I go to see the Pope? Um, and, and basically complained to him about all of this. 
Will you move for society? No, you're not going to see the Pope. I need you here, and I don't want you to go to complain to the Pope. A further reason why William wouldn't want him to go and complain to the Pope is because there were, in fact, not one, but two Popes. Uh, Pope Urban II, which is the one Anselm wanted to go and see, that was the one he thought was the real Pope, and there was somebody called the Anti-Pope. Um, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, you you can find that out on my timelines that I've just made. The Anti-Pope. Um, was not somebody who was like the anti pope against the Pope. It wasn't like Jack, Batman and Joker. It was somebody who said he was the Pope. And it was all to do with politics in uh, Central Europe. But William Rufus was quite happy about this because it meant he didn't have to deal with any Pope if he just kept out of it and didn't recognise either of them as the official Pope. But Anselm saying, can I go and see the Pope? Well, if William had said, yeah, you can go and see the Pope, that's him sort of saying, yeah, I recognise this Pope as the Pope. And then he becomes involved in it, which he didn't really want. Anselm wasn't taking no for an answer. He said, I need to go and get my pallium. Now, pallium is a piece of wool that uh, they was given to a piece of cloth. No, not necessarily wool. A piece of cloth given by the Pope to bishops or archbishops um, in recognition that the Pope agrees that this person should be the archbishop. So Anselm says, I need to go and get my pallium to show that I'm officially the archbishop. And William's like, you're not going to get your pallium. And they fell out about this again. They had a big meeting, in fact. Um, which again you can read about on the timeline, a very important meeting, um, and at the meeting all the nobles of the land, they came along um, and they discussed this. They never came up with a solution really. And what William did afterwards is he sent off for the pallium and brought it back. So he kind of made a, um, what do you got, a concession there, he, a compromise. He sent off to the Pope, so he had to recognise Pope Urban II as the actual Pope instead of the anti-Pope, um, which he wasn't happy about. But he got this pallium, brought it back to Anselm. He's like, here you go, you've got your pallium. Now shut up. I probably didn't say shut up. Anselm still wasn't happy. Anselm ended up fleeing the country. So this is why he has such a bad reputation. He kept falling out with the church. But that's not all about William Rufus. Actually, this bad reputation is not necessarily very well earned. Because there were other aspects of his reign that he did really well. The main area that he did really well was warfare. In warfare, he did particularly well. Now, at the start of his reign, well, it wasn't really clear before he reigned in England that he was going to at all because he had an older brother, and his older brother was called Robert Curthose. When William the Conqueror died, he had th three sons. Robert Curthose, the oldest, William Rufus, the second oldest, and Henry, the youngest. Henry only got treasure. William Rufus got to be King of England. Robert Curthose got to be Duke of Normandy. So he divided it like that, which Robert Curthose wasn't particularly happy about because he thought, well, I should inherit it all here. Um, but maybe a reason for that is because Robert Curthose and William the Conqueror fell out and fought each other before William died. Um, and England was definitely the best thing for him to get rather than Normandy because England was, where, was really wealthy. It was easy to get rich from England. And then so during this whole period, William Rufus is the brother with the cash. He becomes King of England in 1087, and in 1088, just one year later, there's a massive rebellion, led by none other than Bishop Odo. You remember the bishop with the club at Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror's half-brother, and therefore William Rufus's half-uncle. Not just him, though. Other barons um, seem to have uh, risen up, partly because they supported Robert Curthose instead of William Rufus. Now, Robert never actually made it across to England, for whatever reason, during this rebellion. William Rufus must have been looking around the country thinking there's rebellion up there, there's rebellion up there, there's rebellion down there, there. but it's all led by Bishop Odo, so I'm going to get him. Bishop Odo was also Earl of Kent, so that is where William Rufus went. He laid siege to uh, Castle and took William Rufus um, and sent him to a castle, Ro Rochester Castle, I believe. Again, this is all top of my head, you'll have to look on the timeline. And when he got there, um, he was supposed to be held prisoner, but Bishop Odo must have been very persuasive because he managed to convince the people in the castle to join him in rebellion again. So William Rufus captured him, sent him to another castle to be prisoner, and he manages to take that castle, and William Rufus has to lay siege to that castle. But he managed to get Bishop Odo, and he kicks him out of the country. Then he goes to deal with the other rebels, and he does. He sorts them out piece by piece. But one of the things he was, he was quite lenient with any rebel barons that he managed to... Uh, take, which made other rebel barons think, oh, if I give up, then he's not going to be that mean to me, so maybe I'll switch sides, which was a clever move, being lenient in that particular case. And the 1088 rebellion was defeated. 
So militarily, more things that he did that were really good is in 1091, perhaps as a response to the 1088 rebellion to get a bit of revenge, he invaded Normandy. It never actually came to a fight because Robert Curtis must have been worried. They made a deal and he got control of large parts of northern Normandy. So by this time, 1091, he's got control of England and the northern part of Normandy. Not a bad ruler in that sense. Um, in 1091... Um, in 10, and in 1092 he had to deal with Scotland and Northern England, which he did, defeated the Scottish King Malcolm. Malcolm ended up dead as a result of uh, causing trouble. Um, in 1094 he went back to Normandy um, because there was a bit of rumblings of trouble because he'd not been there since 1091. Um, and people, con some of the barons at the time in Nor Normandy were complaining that he'd not kept to his deals of the treaty. So he started raiding and plundering properties there and thereabouts in 1094, and he threatened to gather an army, he got his man, his man, his, his man, not that, that, Ranulf Flambard, he's very important, we'll talk about him in a little bit, to start to gather an army. Um, but in 1095, something big happened. In 1095, William Rufus got control of all of Normandy and all of England. And this was because of Pope Urban II, we've talked about him before. Pope Urban II wanted there to be a crusade to the Holy Land, to take back the lands of Bethlehem, Jerusalem, that sort of place, from the infidels, from the, the Muslims, basically. Um, and so he said, anybody who is holy, join us on this crusade to reclaim the Holy Land. You might have seen about this, you've seen lots of films, it's quite a famous thing. And Robert Curtis wanted to go. William Rufus said, I'll foot you the bill, because it costs a fortune to go on a crusade. Um, and so for the princely sum of 10,000 marks, a huge sum of money, Robert Curtis said, pay me that, you can have Normandy. I'll go on crusade, and when I come back, if I've got the money, I'll pay you back for Normandy, and I'll take control of it again. Or if I don't have the money, um, then you get to keep Normandy, or you'd assume. I mean, that, that's a very um, specific terms. It's probably a bit less... And we don't know for sure those were the exact terms, but we do know that William Rufus paid 10,000 marks for control of Normandy, and he got control of Normandy. Hooray! So by 1095, he's got control of everywhere. Also in 1095, he faced his other rebellion. He only really faced two serious rebellions uh, in England. 1088, we've talked about. 1095, a man called Robert of Mowbray, who was Earl of Northumbria. Um, he decided he was a bit upset about this, that and the other. He actually stole a load of stuff from some Norwegian ships. William Rufus paid the Norwegians back for this, um, but he had ordered Robert of Mowbray to pay him, and Robert Mowbray was like, I'd pay him. Um, so Robert of Mowbray rebelled, and William went north with an army. He defeated William, uh, Robert of Mowbray's brother first, uh, in a particular in Tynemouth Castle, um, and then he went to Bamburgh Castle, which is where Robert of Mowbray was. He must assume this would have been a big, imposing fortress, and he couldn't really take it. Or he didn't try. He thought, well, maybe... You can assume he's like, oh, maybe this is going to be too hard to take this castle, so I've got another idea. His idea was to build another castle right next door, which he did. And when he built it, he went back south. He called that castle Bad Neighbour. Great name. Um, and when he went back south, Robert of Mowbray tried to escape from Bamburgh Castle, but the people in Bad Neighbour Castle saw him trying to escape, caught him, and he spent either the rest of his life in prison or as a nun. One or, uh, not a nun, that would be stupid, as a monk. Um, one or the other, but we're not entirely sure. Now, another reason why he has a bad reputation is perhaps because of all this fighting. It costs money, I've told you this before. One of the most expensive things you can do as a ruler is go to war. Um, and also, 10,000 marks to pay for Normandy was a huge sum. In fact, people at the time said that the money, that the taxes that were imposed on the people of England to pay for Normandy it was known as an unbearable geld, which, um, well, it's just unbearable, you know what that means. Geld is like tax, which was used at the time. So people were not happy about all this taxing that was going on. Um, one area of military, uh, one area of the military that he didn't do so well was with, with Wales, because the Welsh didn't stand and fight. They kept going away to hide in the hills. Um, so he tried twice to invade and sort the Welsh problem out and never really succeeded. Now, I said I'd tell you about Ranulf Flambard. This was one of William Rufus's chief advisers, his right-hand man. When William II died in a hunting accident in the New Forest in 1100, and his younger brother Henry took the throne, one of the first things Henry did was to put Ranulf Flambard into prison. And Ranulf Flambard escaped from prison uh, with a rope that he got smuggled in. I believe, I think the story goes that he got the guards drunk or something. Anyway, he managed to escape from prison. Eventually, Henry I saw his use and, and used him as well. But before this, he was William Rufus's main man. 
And um, when he wanted that army in in Normandy into 91, it was it was Ranulf Flambard who he sent to go and sort out all these troops. Um, and Ranulf Flambard was the one who gained all the money. He was the one who extracted the taxes. As you can imagine, Ranulf Flambard was not a very popular man, but he's very important. He might come up in some of the sources when you're asked about him, uh, about William Rufus, that is. Anyway, as I say, at the end of his life, what happened in 1100 is there was a hunting accident. Now we're never going to be sure whether it was actually an accident or actually murder. It's, it's no way of knowing. It seems like it could be murder because then his younger brother becomes king. But So there you have it. William Rufus falls out with the church, quite good at fighting, dies in a hunting accident, maybe murder. His younger brother takes over, spends a lot of time arguing with his brothers, ends up in control of all of Normandy and all of England. Hmm, there we go.